Hello, my name is Stephen Roman, and this is the first in what I hope will be a series of lectures on elementary category theory. I, uh, let me, I'd like to begin just by introducing myself. I'm a retired professor of mathematics. I taught for about 40 years. My website, for more details, is sroman.com. Since about 1981 or 82, I began writing books in mathematics. I found that I enjoyed writing more than research. I had done research for about eight years years or so in combinatorics and graph theory and in the umbral calculus. I worked for many years on that with my friend Giancarlo Rota. Uh, my first book was on the umbral calculus published by Academic Press. At this point now it's a Dober publication. And after writing that first book, I decided I enjoyed writing more than I enjoyed research. So I pretty much devoted myself full-time to writing. Uh, just to give you some examples, this is my one of my graduate texts in mathematics, Advanced Linear Algebra. Coding and Information Theory. field theory, fundamentals of group theory, this is a Burkheuser publication, all these others are, are Springer, which amounts to the same thing I guess these days, lattices and ordered sets, those are graduate level books, this is uh, Introduction to the Mathematics of Finance, uh, it's an undergraduate textbook in the UTM series. This is also in the UTM series an introduction to coding and information theory. An introduction to discrete mathematics. This was actually the second book I ever wrote. In addition to mathematics books I've also written a number of books in computer programming. This is Writing Excel Macros published by O'Reilly and this is Access Database Design and Programming also published by O'Reilly. Also although it's quite off the subject I just very recently finished a book on one of my hobbies which is folding knives so if you're interested in folding knives um, you can find some information about this book on my website as well. This year I completed a book on Catalan numbers that's in production now. And more recently than that, I just finished a book on category theory. And uh, the lectures I want to give are based on that book. In the reason I wrote the book is the following. In the last five years of my teaching, I taught a graduate algebra class. It's a year sequence. I taught it five times in a row at the University of California, Irvine. And I was surprised that a number of my students had told me that in some of their other classes the professors said that they would like to incorporate some category theory, but the professors said they weren't going to do that because they didn't think the students had any background in category theory. So so I'm always looking for something to write and I thought that possibly a short elementary introduction to category theory uh, might be very useful for students. It's not necessarily a book designed for a whole course in category theory but something that can be used as independent study by graduate students or advanced undergraduate students or uh, mathematicians outside the field or scientists who need to know something about category theory. It does come up uh, in computer science for example. So that's the origin of my book. It's under review right now uh, by Springer. 
one way or the other, it's going to get published. If they decide not to publish it, I will publish it myself and sell it directly. So let's just plunge right in. Category theory is a relatively young subject developed in the early 1940s by two individuals, Saunders McLean and Samuel Eilenberg. McLean wrote a very famous book in category theory called Categories for the Working Mathematician. It's an excellent book, but it's not an easy book to read by any means. First sentence in his book is, and I quote, Category theory starts with the observation that many properties of mathematical systems can be unified and simplified by a presentation with diagrams of arrows. Category theory, to be sure, is a very abstract subject. Abstraction is a very common theme in mathematics. Let me give you an example. Let's just take, uh, for example, the set R star of positive, I'm sorry, non-zero real numbers. I'm going to do the best to write as legibly as I can. Uh, after so many years of typing without writing, it's a little difficult, but uh, I will do the best I can. <clears throat> and uh, we, under the operation of multiplication, take the set of n by k matrices. Uh, under addition. And take the set B of bijections of the integers with the operation of composition. Now, in these three uh, cases, one could prove individually in each case that every element of the set has an inverse and that that inverse is unique. But I don't think any mathematician student would do that. They would simply observe that all three of these are an example of an abstraction, an abstract concept called a group, and that in groups, inverses are unique. So once the inverses were established, once it was shown that they existed, uh, it would be very simple in one line to prove that inverses are unique. So we suppose that alpha and beta are inverses of an element A in the group. Let's call the group G. Then alpha is equal to alpha uh, a beta, I, I guess I should write alpha equals alpha 1 equals alpha a beta equals alpha a beta equals 1 beta equals beta. This abstraction and this very short proof has done several things. First of all, it has clarified the issue, clarified the issue of uniqueness. of inverses. Because it says that the uniqueness of inverses has nothing whatever to do with real numbers, matrices, or bijections. It's simply an issue of the existence of an identity and the associative property. It has unified this concept. It has also economized our efforts. One line proves the uniqueness of inverses in any group. So it's much more economical to prove that inverses are unique in the abstract setting of a group than it is 
to prove it every time we need it in every example that comes along. So this, this abstraction has done several really useful things. Well, that's what Saunders McLean was talking about in that first sentence I read to you. I'll read it again. Category theory starts with the observation that many properties of mathematical systems can be unified and simplified or clarified by the presentation with diagrams of arrows. So category theory is an effort to do for all of mathematics, or essentially all of mathematics, or a great deal of mathematics, what we just did in the context of groups. There are five basic concepts in category theory. The first, of course, is categories itself. The second is functors. Third, natural transformations. Fourth, universality. And fifth, adjoints or adjunctions. There is a matter of foundations that has to be dealt with. One of the things we will want to talk about, for example, is the category of all sets. Now part of the definition of a category is that there is a bunch of objects. And uh, the objects in this case are sets, and so we face the issue of the collection of all sets. What is that? We cannot refer to it as the set of all sets because we run into uh, problems with well-known paradoxes. So the way out for us is to talk about classes. Classes are similar to sets. One of the, you can uh, do certain operations with classes like union, for example. But one of the things that uh, you can't do is a set can be an element of another set but a class can never be an element of another class. And just that simple uh, restriction kind of bails us out on a lot of these paradoxes, and so we'll be able to talk about the class of all sets and the class of all groups and so on without having any problems. Uh, every set is a class, but there are classes that are not sets, and they're referred to as proper classes. A proper class is a class that's not a set. Okay. So we're ready for the definition of the category. A category, and I'll usually use script C or script D for categories, consists of the following. First, a class OBJ of C of objects. What are the objects of a category? Well, in, in the general sense, we don't know. They're just something that we call objects. So we're being very abstract here. Okay. I'll use uh, uppercase Roman letters for objects. And instead of writing A is a member of the object class of C, I'll just write A is in C like this. That, that's common notation. That means that A is an object. The other part of a category are morphisms. For each pair A, B of objects, and A and B don't have to be distinct, they can be the same, there exists a set, and this is deliberately a set, not a class, 
<clears throat> called a HOM set. for the pair AB. A notation we will use is HOM AB and put a subscript C here when we need to clarify in case there's more than one category under consideration. The elements of a HOM set are called morphisms maps sometimes or arrows. Those are the three most common terms for the elements of a category, uh, uh, morphisms in a category. Notation just like functional notation but keep in mind we are defining a very abstract concept here. All I said was that between two objects A and B, or for a pair of objects A, B, there is a set of something, and the elements of that something are called morphisms, maps, or arrows. They may not have anything whatever to do with functions in the real world that we know of as, as mathematicians. May not be homomorphisms, they may not be functions from set functions, they're just another kind of object really. Another notation I will use that I find useful in equations sometimes is uh, F with subscript AB. Keep in mind that A and B are not playing a symmetric role here so the HOM set AB is not the same as HOM, that's a, not equal to HOM BA. Okay. As a matter of fact, <coughs> oh, um, I should mention also, uh, A, we have F mapping A to B, and again, I say it that way, but I don't mean it that way. Uh, A is called the domain of F, and B is called the codomain of F. So I'll say it once more. Um, domain is just a word here, just a definition. It, it doesn't mean that F is a function whose domain is A and whose codomain is B. It just means that F is a morphism, whatever that is, and its domain is A and its uh, codomain is B. By the way, uh, B is not the range of F nor the image of F, those terms don't enter into uh, category theory, into the definition of a category. One of the requirements is that uh, <clears throat> distinct HOM sets are disjoint. But I have to say right away that not all authors require that condition. It's not going to be a big deal for us. It does come up in one point, in one proof, where it is very useful. But there are ways around it. So uh, it's, it's not an essential requirement. But it does simplify things a little bit. And for an introductory course, I see no, no problems with it. So a category, as we've seen then, consists of two types of things, objects and morphisms between objects. <clears throat> there must also be a composition of morphisms. So if F maps A to B and G maps B to C, <clears throat> then there must exist a morphism from A to C called the composition of A and of F and, F and G. It, I, another piece of terminology I find helpful is when you have a morphism from A to B is to say that F leaves A and enters B. 
leaves A and enters B. That's kind of a useful way of talking. <clears throat> so the composition leaves A and enters C. Okay. Composition must be associative. So F composed with G composed with H is F composed with G composed with H. This is for compatible morphisms, and I, I, I don't need to go into that. Uh, since you're familiar with composition of functions, uh, um, <clears throat> whenever I write a composition of two morphisms, it's with the tacit understanding that the <clears throat> codomain of the first one is the same as the domain of the second one, so that the composition makes sense according to this definition. Finally, identity morphisms. For each object A in the category, there exists a morphism denoted 1A, mapping A to A, for which, <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> FAB followed by 1B is equal to FAB and FAB preceded by 1A is FAB. Here's an example where I like that subscript notation which I don't see very often. In fact, I'm not sure I've seen it anywhere else. But it does seem to be useful in situations like this. The class of all morphisms I will denote by MOR of C. <coughs> Another uh, issue that comes up with this definition, you will recall that <coughs> for the morphisms, the HOM sets were defined to be sets. Some authors allow HOM classes rather than HOM sets. We're not going to need that. We're not going to worry about that too much in these lectures. But just to be clear on this, um, if HOM classes are used, instead of HOM sets, then when the HOM classes are in fact HOM sets for a particular category, that category is said to be locally small. Sets are to be thought of as smaller than classes in general. So all of our categories are locally small because I have specified that all the that uh, all the HOM classes have to be HOM sets. Related definition: If the two classes, objects of C and morphisms of C, are sets, then C is called a small category. So some categories, uh, when we get to examples, are small. Um, most are not small. But for us, they're, they are all locally small. So let's look at some examples. The first group of examples are all, I think you would admit, pretty obvious. Uh, the first one, sets. In my book, I would make that bold face to indicate a category. So here I'll just use this squiggly underline. The category sets has for its objects 
all sets, the class of all sets, and for its morphisms, set functions. Now I have to be more specific here. I haven't. I have to say what each HOM set is. Very seldom do we really talk about the class of all morphisms of a category. We're almost always interested in the local morphisms, the ones that map a specific object to another specific object. So this is a set of all set functions from A to B. <clears throat> Another uh, simple category, groups, GRPS. I'm going to be a little more. Uh, I'm going to do, be a little more brief here. Uh, the objects are the, consists of the class of all groups, and the HOM set from G to H. These are the group homomorphisms. from G to H. I don't need to go through the fact that composition exists and, and is associative and there are identities. I'm, I'm sure you know all about that. We can do the same thing uh, for abelian groups. That's a category where the objects are abelian groups and the morphisms, the HOM sets, are again group homomorphisms. Same, same HOM sets as in the groups category. We can do modules over a ring. So the objects are the R modules and the morphisms are the R maps. Vector spaces over a field that's a category. The objects are all vector, the class of all vector spaces over F, and the morphisms are the linear transformations. Ring with ring maps, commutative ring, objects are the commutative rings with ring maps, <coughs> ring homomorphisms, <coughs> fields. And the objects are fields, and the morphisms are ring embeddings. <clears throat> Posets. The objects are the uh, class of all partially ordered sets. <clears throat> and a morphism, these are the monotone maps. So what's a monotone map? <clears throat> a less than or equal to B implies FA less than or equal to FB. They preserve the inequality structure in a poset. <clears throat> relations, the category of all relations. The objects in this case are sets, and a morphism, the HOM set, between two relations, I mean between two sets, this is the, the set of all relations from R to S. As you know, relations can be composed and they're the composition is associative and there's an identity relation and so on. So this is an example, our first example of the fact that the name of the category is not the name of the objects like it is in the other cases, but it's actually the name of the morphisms. And that does happen from time to time. Topological spaces. The objects are uh, the class of all topological spaces and the, the morphisms from uh, A to B are the continuous functions. Smooth manifolds. 
<clears throat> Here the objects are manifolds and the morphisms are smooth maps. So that's a collection of examples, none of which should really be surprising. Let's look at some a little more unusual examples. <clears throat> this is matrices over a field. The objects in this case are the positive integers. As far as the HOM set, HOM MN is the set of all N by M matrices over F. Note the reversal of the roles of M and N here. Composition is to be matrix product and so I'm going to leave it for you to think about why it's necessary to reverse the roles of M and N. This is another category where the name of the category the category is named after the morphisms and not the objects. Another possibility is to take a single algebraic structure. Let's say M is a monoid. So a monoid is a non-empty set with a single operation that is associative and for which there is an identity. And uh, <clears throat> this is the only object just M itself. So that's very small. The morphisms are the elements. So if we take an element A in M, it's got to have a domain and a codomain, and the only possibility is the only object that exists, so A will map M to M. Okay. Composition is product. And I'll let you uh, sort out any details that you might feel are missing from there. You can do this with other algebraic structures like groups, for example. Here's an interesting example. <clears throat> Let's take a partially ordered set, a single partially ordered set. The objects of this cat of a category post set P less than or equal to the objects are the elements of the set. <clears throat> As to the morphisms. Um, a, B, there is a single morphism which I denote by A, B if A is less than or equal to B and no morphisms if A is not less than or equal to B. So the existence of a morphism is equivalent to saying that the domain is less than or equal to the codomain. Put another way, given the collection of morphisms is the same as being given the order relation. What about composition? 
if we have AB mapping A to B, that happens if and only if A is less than or equal to B. And if we have BC mapping B to C, and that happens if and only if B is less than or equal to C, then of course we know that by transitivity A is less than or equal to C, and therefore, therefore there exists the map AC mapping A to C. And that's the composition of AB and BC. So AB followed by BC is equal to AC. Identity exists because of the reflexive property 1A mapping A to A exists. So that's a, a, an unusual example of a category. To be perfectly honest, um, all this is great fun, <clears throat> but I don't think we're really going to see the power of the concept of a category until we define some categories that are defined in terms of other categories like comma categories and homset categories. And that's where we begin to build a sophisticated theory of, uh, of categories. I guess the same thing works in other areas. For example, group theory. You can define a group. You can give a bunch of examples. But if you stop there, all you can say is, well, great, all these, all these specific examples that I've known for a long time are just special cases of one concept, but so what? And it's not until you get into the theory that begin, you begin to realize how useful the concept is. So it's going to take a little while for us to develop that point. Um, I think in all, in all classes in, in mathematics, one has to have, as a student, one has to have a little bit of faith that what's coming will be important at some point, even if the first few days or week or so of a course seems a little bit maybe unmotivating. In category theory, we've got the same problem. <clears throat> Let me give you one last example of a category before we move on or two actually it's two examples <clears throat> let's say this comes let's say we have a deductive system of logic could be the propositional calculus or could be the predicate calculus or something else <clears throat> then uh, we can take for our objects the well-formed formulas in the system. I'm not going to go into details on this. If it makes sense to you, great. If not, please just bear with me for just a couple of minutes here. What about morphisms? <clears throat> HOM WU. Similar to the uh, POSET example we just did, we could take uh, this to be a single morphism WU if <clears throat> there exists a proof of U assuming W. As long as uh, U can be proved from W uh, and of course from the axioms of the system using the rules of deduction. And otherwise <clears throat> there's no morphisms. That'll give us a category. <clears throat> Alternatively, we can take our objects to be well-formed formulas and as for the HOM set, this can be the set of 
all proofs of you assuming W. So each specific proof, <clears throat> namely U followed by alpha 1 through alpha K, concluding with, I'm sorry, W, concluding with U, that's a proof. So each of the alphas is either an axiom or comes from the previous items in the list using a rule of deduction. And the final one is U. <clears throat> Each proof is a morphism. So these two categories are related but clearly different. <clears throat> okay, enough of the examples for now. Category theory is, I think you can see from the definition and the examples, quite general. It's a very general concept. But it is precisely what we need to make two key points about mathematics. One is that morphisms are just as important as the things they morph. If you think about your linear algebra courses and your abstract algebra courses and your topology courses and your geometry courses and so on, they would be much less rich if you didn't talk about functions that preserve the relevant structure. Uh, homomorphisms, continuous functions, smooth maps, whatever they are, are vitally important to the subject. And in some sense, arguably, just as important as the objects that they, they act upon. <clears throat> so you can see that reflected in the definition of a category. The role of morphisms uh, is just as important as the role of the objects they morph. When you study, let's say, for example, vector spaces, you define vector spaces and you talk about subspaces and quotient spaces and direct products and so on uh, before you, generally before you even mention linear transformations. That comes in a later chapter. But for categories, it's part of the definition. The second tenant you might say, is that some mathematical notions <clears throat> are best described in terms of morphisms, not in terms of elements. And uh, that's going to be one that's going to be a little difficult to understand at this point. Um, but I think I can give you an example so that you don't go away unsatisfied with that. Uh, and the example is <coughs> direct product. of vector spaces. So let's suppose that V and W are vector spaces over a field F. The direct product, as you well know, is defined to be the set, this is the external direct product, ordered pairs of vectors. And the operations, addition and scalar multiplication, are done component wise. No news here at all. After this definition is given, typically, sometime after, maybe quite a bit after, 
one defines the projection maps. Row 1, which sends V cross W to V. So row 1 of little VW is V. And row 2. V cross W is sent to W. Row 2 of VW is W. Okay? <clears throat> but oftentimes the role of the projection maps is not made very clear and uh, they're kind of, you know, not given their just due. Category theory is here to um, reverse that deficiency, you might say. And here's the way it goes. <clears throat> it's possible to show that the ordered triple consisting of the direct product V cross W and the two projections, so we're kind of boosting the projections up to the same level as the direct product itself, that, that this ordered triple has a special property. It's called a universal property. And the property is this. <clears throat> it's best described, as McLean would say, with diagrams of arrows. So these are the projection maps. And the property goes like this. <clears throat> if x sigma 1 sigma 2 exists, so here's x is a vector space, sigma 1 maps x to v, and sigma 2 maps x to w <clears throat> for any such triple I guess it would be better to say it that way for any triple <clears throat> there exists a unique and I'm going to emphasize that unique uh, map and when I say map now we're talking about linear transformations but it's a lot easier to write the word map tau from x to v cross w such that let me let me put that in here I'll put dotted lines for there exists unique tau the exclamation point here means unique okay. such that these two triangles here commute, which means that if we first follow tau, then row 1, that's the same as taking sigma 1, and the same on the other side. So tau followed by row 1 is equal to sigma 1, and tau followed by row 2 is equal to sigma 2. So, I'll say again. <clears throat> The triple direct product with projections has the following universal property. For any triple vector space and two maps that kind of look like projections in the sense of their, at least their codomain, from x to v, x to w, for any such ordered triple, there's a unique, what you might call connecting map, the actual term is mediating morphism. We'll see this term many times in the future. Don't worry about it now. There's a unique mediating morphism from x to v cross w such that these two compositions hold, these two uh, commutivity relations hold. This property turns out to be, in some sense, well, it turns out to be characterizing of direct product in the following sense. <clears throat> if an ordered triple, 
So here again we have a vector space and lambda 1 maps u to v and lambda 2 maps u to w has this universal property so what I'm saying then if we look back at this picture is that you could put u here for v cross w and put lambda 1 and lambda 2 here and then this same statement would hold for any triple x sigma 1 sigma 2 there would be a unique mediating morphism from x to u so that these triangles commute so if this ordered triple has that universal property we described for the direct product then u is isomorphic to v cross w so what we are saying here is that the universal property that I've just described characterizes the direct product up to isomorphism. So the direct product and only the direct product up to isomorphism has this universal property. Well, if a property characterizes a concept like direct product, then it is essentially as good as the definition of the direct product. And of course, we have to deal with the issue of up to isomorphism, but if you're willing to accept that, if you're willing to accept the fact that two vector spaces that are isomorphic are in many respects the same, they're not identical, uh, you do have to be careful of that, but they're, they're, uh, they're almost the same, uh, <clears throat> then the universal property describes the direct product, period. Okay. In fact, it, not so much in this context, but in other contexts, we will see, in, and you will see in more advanced courses in, in, uh, in mathematics, that mapping properties like this are used as the definition. For example, the case of a free group you've got two ways to define that. One is by discussing what the elements of the group are and how they how you take products and so on. Uh, that's the non-categorical definition. But you can also define free group in terms of a universal property, also called, by the way, a universal mapping property, uh, sometimes abbreviated UMP. Okay. So th this sort of uh, approach uh, gives you a totally different definition of some concepts that in some sense goes to the heart of the matter. <clears throat> okay, well I think this 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 lecture has gone on long enough, 57 minutes. Uh, if it was a regular lecture, uh, students would already be standing up and trying to get to their next class. So I'm going to end the lecture now. Let me know what you think about it. Uh, and uh, it'll help me decide whether to continue these lectures or not. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it.